with the number of people that I've met over the years who have cancer and things like that, I, I, I've seen a lot of people die. And I, I've had plenty of time to think about my own death. And, and when I die, I can't imagine standing in the presence of our creator, whoever or whatever you believe that entity to be, and being unable to account for the gifts and the talents that I was born with and that I didn't use to make the world a better place. Thanks for joining the CC America podcast, where we are getting mentally fit through testimonies of faith, inspiration, and transformation. We hope you enjoy the show. Good evening. This is Tamaria Jordan, and I am the host of the CC America podcast. This is a show all about getting mentally fit. What that means is sharing stories of faith, inspiration, and transformation. Tonight, you are all in for a treat. On this episode, I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Terry Tucker. Terry has been an NCAA Division I college basketball player, a Citadel cadet, a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, an undercover narcotics investigator, SWAT team hostage negotiator, a high school basketball coach, business owner, motivational speaker, author, and most recently, a cancer warrior. He and his wife have lived all over the United States and currently reside in Colorado with their daughter and Wheaton Terrier, Maggie. In 2019, Terry started the website Motivational Check to help others find and lead their uncommon and extraordinary lives. We will talk more about how you can get in contact with Terry and also how you can view his website, motivationalcheck.com. Terry's life story is one of fortitude, grit, and determination. Despite the setbacks that he has encountered, he still finds the strength to keep fighting, not only for himself, but encouraging others to do the same. In this episode, Terry is going to share with us tonight his personal journey as a professional who has reinvented himself multiple times. He's going to talk about how cancer has changed his life. And he's also going to share with us about his website, Motivational Check, and also his book, Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. So his book was created to help others lead a life of significance as well as a life of success. And as you can tell, he has been doing this. This is what he does every day. So I am so excited to welcome to the show, Mr. Terry Tucker. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Tamari. I appreciate it. I'm very much looking forward to talking to you tonight. You're welcome. And thanks so much for joining us. So i like to kick off the episode by letting you tell our guest in your own words, who is Terry Tucker? So I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version because what you just described, I, I was listening to it and it kind of makes me feel like, well, gee, one of these days I'm going to grow up and figure out what I'm supposed to do with my life, you know, <laughs> but so you, you can't tell this, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I played basketball in college at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. I have a, a brother who's six foot seven, who was wow. a pitcher for the University of Notre Dame. And then my middle brother is six foot six, and he was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the National Basketball Association. And then my right. dad was six foot five. So if you sat behind our family in church growing up, there wasn't a <laughs> prayers chance you were going to see anything that was going on. Of course, my mom was like 5'8 or 5'7, and whatever she said went. It didn't matter how big or, or tall or strong we were. Mom was still the boss. So as I said, I went to college in Charleston, South Carolina. When I graduated, I moved home to find a job. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college, and I was kind of all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. Fortunately, I ended up finding that first job. As you mentioned, uh, I was a marketing executive in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the, the hamburger chain. But unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. I, I won't go into any more specifics about my, my uh, professional career, 
But as you mentioned, uh, my wife and I have been together. We've been married for 27 years. And our only child, a daughter, is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is a lieutenant in the newly created Space Force. So in a nutshell, wow. that's pretty much me. Wow, that's amazing. You have an amazing background and and hats off on all of the accomplishments. I know you said it, it seems like, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up? But for a lot of people, they're probably afraid to take that next step and try something new, but but you did it. And that's awesome. Just your family background is definitely very interesting. I think it it shows how many opportunities that we can have depending on how we look at life and also if we're open to them. So hats off. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I didn't want any grass growing under my feet, so to speak. And, you know, I, I took opportunities when they came about. I love that. So speaking of which, how have various life events helped mm. shape the person that you are or that the, the person that you've become? So Probably the greatest challenge of my life began in 2012 when I was diagnosed with this rare form of cancer. And I know we'll get to that here in a minute. But when I go back and, and look at my life, especially in high school, so I played Division I college basketball, despite the fact that I had three knee surgeries in high school. And two of those knee surgeries were before arthroscopic surgery was available. So I have the large kind of zipper scar on the outside of my knee. And after the second surgery, my doctor told me they, they took out 25 pieces of my bone. And my doctor told me that basketball was done and that I might not walk normally again. So that was the first time I really faced a challenge. And, and I knew that, you know, up to this point in my life, I was probably 14 or 15. It was the only success basketball was really the only success I'd had in my life. And I, and I wasn't ready to give it up. So I fought diligently to learn to walk again. And then, you know, walking turned to jogging, jogging turned to running. And eventually I was able to play again. So th that was one experience that I think has helped me with cancer. And then, as you mentioned, I was a, I was a police officer. And one of the things that uh, you know, we were trained in in, in the, the police academy was defensive tactics. And our defensive tactics instructor used to have us bring a photograph of the people that we love the most to class. And we would look at that photograph as we trained because he reasoned that we would fight harder for the people we love then we would fight for ourselves. So he wanted us to realize that if we were fighting some drunk guy at three o'clock in the morning, that we needed to make sure that we came home because this was bigger than us. That, you know, there was a husband or a wife or a child or a mom or dad or brother or sister. Somebody was at home wanting us to come home. So that was an experience that I remembered. And, and I've always put my family first or as much as I, as I possibly could. So those two things certainly helped me when this terrible disease, this terrible form of melanoma presented in 2012. Wow, that's really powerful and, and definitely a, a good life lesson because to your point, most of us, we will fight harder definitely for our families and sometimes others than we will for ourselves. And just the, again, the grit and determination to say, you know, the doctor's telling me I won't walk again, but you started running and started doing all of the things they told you, you you couldn't do. So that combined with the different hats that you've worn over the years, and I'm glad that you brought in into the mix your experience with the police academy. What role did you have that was the most fulfilling out of the different roles that you've had in life in terms of your positions and your career? And why is that particular role as fulfilling as it is? So w w without a doubt, the, 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 the best job, and I, and I, don't, I hate to, to really call it a job, was, was being a husband and a father. That, I mean, there was a point in my life where I did not think I wanted children. And I am so glad that, that God sort of tweaked me a little bit there and said, hey, no, I, I think you should probably have a child. It was the greatest, one of the greatest blessings I've ever had in my life. But in terms of my professional career, I would say that the thing I enjoyed the most was being a, a SWAT team hostage negotiator. 
And it was it was unique because as a policeman, usually the person you're dealing with is in front of you and, you know, you can see them. So if they're standing there and they're balling up their fists, that probably means they're thinking about fighting you. Or if they're looking around, it probably means they may be trying to run or escape from you. And and when you see that, you can mitigate that. You can handcuff them. You can put them in the back of your car. You can sit them down on the sidewalk. There's things you can do. But as a negotiator, the person we were talking to wasn't with us. They they very well could have been a block away or, or, or you know, someplace where we couldn't see them. So we had to kind of figure things out based on what they were saying, what they weren't saying, and how they were saying it. And, and there were a lot of times where, you know, we would go down an avenue thinking that, you know, this is this is what's wrong or this is what the problem was. And we were we were just totally off base, like, absolutely, you know, the person get mad at us. It's like, you know, aren't you listening to me? I, that's not oh, what wow. I'm saying. It's like, OK, I, I blew that one. You know, now I've got to kind of regroup and, and go down an, another avenue. So that for me was incredibly fulfilling, incredibly rewarding, but in some cases, very sad because I'd say probably. 85, 90% of the time we were successful of getting the person to come out and, and ending the situation safely. But there were probably 10% of the times that we didn't, where the person decided they were going to take their own life. And I never lost any sleep over that. And I don't want your audience to think I'm callous. But I realized that if you were talking to me, you were probably having the worst day of your life. Right. And whatever the problem was, A, I didn't create it. And B, it had probably been going on for, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it was. And it finally came to a head. And now in a few hours, I was expected to try to to mitigate that. And and sometimes that just wasn't realistic. So I, I feel I feel bad for those people that decided to end their life. But I knew that I had great training. I worked with great people and I did the very best I could to always try to get people, you know, to come out because that's a human being. I don't care what they did. I don't care what's going on in their life. They're still a person. They have value. And, and I wanted to try to make sure they continued to have value. But again, sometimes that was their decision. Right. I and mean, that that makes sense for sure. And it's things that most of us, because we aren't faced with that same situation, we don't really know how we would handle it. So to your point, that that makes sense for sure. And I think it's hard sometimes because people can't walk a mile in someone's shoes unless they have an opportunity to do the same thing. But we're all so different with our experience. I, I don't think anyone can judge you for that because we can't, I can't say I've been in that experience to even know what it feels to, to have to have those conversations. Yeah, it, it, it's it's very difficult. And like I said, a lot of times we didn't we didn't know what was going on and why things were happening. And, right. you know, to try to I, I, I try to guess in, in a nutshell, look at hostage negotiation kind of like a teeter totter at the park. You know, when we start negotiating, the person's emotional side is way up in the air and they're emotional and they're they're fired up. And over time, our job is to kind of get that teeter totter to kind of come to equilibrium and hopefully get their rational side up in the air. Because when you're rational, you can make good decisions. You know, it's like, I'm going to put the gun down, I'm going to come out. But when you're thinking with your emotional brain, that's not the time to talk about solutions. That's just the time to give you an opportunity to burn off some of that energy by asking you open ended questions and then being quiet and letting you just talk to kind of burn that energy off. So that's kind of in a nutshell, what we did and how we did it. So it's interesting that you described that as one of the most fulfilling roles, because ironically, the next question I had for you was with regard to your role as the SWAT hostage negotiator in terms of like your most life-changing lesson, but based on what you just shared a moment ago, even what advice would you have for someone when they are in an emotional state and they need to come down so that they can actually make a rational decision. So life lesson and any tips on helping people move from emotional to the rational side of their brain. I think when you're, you know, when you're emotional and we're all this way, when you get emotional, 
when you're trying to make a decision and you're emotional, you, you, you won't make a good decision. You won't make a good decision for yourself. So a lot of times what I just recommend for people is go take a walk. Just, just, just go walk around the block, go walk to the park, do whatever you do, but do something physical because that physicality will help you to burn off a lot of that emotional energy. And once that's burned off, then you can start thinking with your rational mind. With When we're rational, we make much better decisions. So, I, you know, like I said, I, we spent a lot of time negotiating with people where we were just asking them a question and an and, and open-ended question, not a yes or no question, but an open-ended question that we wanted them to just talk, just tell, tell me from day one to why we're here today. I don't care if you got to tell me about 10 years of your life, burn off that energy. And obviously, if you're not in a situation where the police are at your door and, and you're talking to a, to a policeman and, and you, you realize you're, you know, you're tense, you're, but I got to make this, this is, go take a walk, go take a walk and relax. And when you do that, you'll have an opportunity to make a much better decision for you. May not be a good decision. There may not be a good alternative, <laughs> right? But there's always a better alternative than one that you make with your with your emotional brain. Great tip and advice for sure. Things that we don't again don't think about. So you mentioned in 2012 being diagnosed with the rare form of cancer. Can you tell us more about that? And also, I guess, what advice you would give others on recognizing this, the warning signs, potentially? Let me start kind of by answering the, the second half of your question, because I, you know, human beings, we, we get scared, and especially when it comes to our health. And, and I mentioned earlier that I, I, I lived with my parents for three and a half years while I helped my mom care for my dad and my grandmother. My dad was diagnosed with end-stage breast cancer. He knew for months and months he was sick and he would not go to a doctor. So my, the best advice I can give to you, especially today, because they are, they are making huge strides in, in cancer research and, and in cancer treatment. I, I mean, there are things that, that I've been able to do that were not available to my dad. And Now, granted, it's been 35 years since he passed away, but you know, if we think something's wrong, we tend to deny, it. you know, it's like, no, no, no nothing. Everything's fine. No, if something's wrong, go see your doctor. I don't care how scared you are, how nervous you are, how worried you are. Go see your doctor, because if you catch it early and, and, and we all know this, this is common sense. We've heard a million American Cancer Society ads out there. If you catch it early, the odds that you will beat it go up exponentially. Just, I, I, I mean, if you wait till my, like I said, my dad got diagnosed, they pretty much told him to go home and die because there wasn't mm. anything they could do for him. But I blame him because he knew he was sick and just wouldn't go to the doctor. And he was certainly of a generation where men didn't go to the doctor. It just wasn't something. But all that is, is an excuse. All that is, is an excuse. And I wish he had been here to meet my wife, to, to meet his granddaughter and, and things like that. But he wasn't. And, and sometimes I get mad and upset that he wasn't. But that was his choice. And that was his destiny. And I guess God wanted him at that point in time. So the best advice I can give you is, it, I don't care what it is, go see your doctor, get it taken care of, because it's not going to get any better if you wait. All you're going to do is have to go through more pain and discomfort the longer you wait, because the more the disease will progress. So that that would be the, the answer to the first part of your question or to the second part of your question. The first part, this disease. So I was a, at the time a high school basketball coach and I was on my feet a lot and I had a callus break open on the bottom of my foot right below my third toe. And I didn't give it a lot of thought because, as I said, I was a, I was a basketball coach. Right. When it when it didn't heal after a couple of weeks, I went to see a podiatrist, a, a foot doctor friend of mine, and he did the 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 normal things. We'll put some pads in there and try to cushion it. And and when that didn't work, he took an X ray, and he said, you know, I think you have a little cyst in there. 
and I can cut it out. And, and he did he cut it out. He cut it out and he showed it to me. And he's like, ah, I've seen thousands of these, no big deal. But I'll send it off to pathology, put a couple stitches in your foot. You'll be good as new in two weeks. Well, that was the last good two weeks that I've had. And two weeks later, I get a call from him. And as I mentioned, he's a, he's a friend of mine. And he couldn't talk. He was having a difficult time telling me what was happening. And the more he was having difficulty speaking, the more frightened I became. Until finally, he just kind of laid it out. He said, Terry, you have a very rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of your feet or the palms of your hands. He said, there's only about 6,500 people in the US that get this form of cancer every year. He said, I've been practicing foot, a, a practicing foot doctor for 25 years. I've never seen this form of cancer. Now you talk about being scared. So he recommended that I go to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, and, and I did. And I went to MD Anderson, I had two surgeries, one to remove the cancer on the bottom of my foot, one to remove all the lymph nodes in my groin. And after I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon to help keep the disease from coming back. My, my oncologist used to, used to talk about kicking the can down the road. We just want to have, you know, the longer we can go with this, the more therapies will be available to you. So I was on that interferon injection for four years and seven months before the medicine became so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees. Fortunately, I was at a level one trauma center and they were able to stabilize me in the ER before I went to the, to, to the ICU because 108 is usually not compatible with being, with being alive. So right. while I was on the interferon, it gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days every week. I lost 50 pounds during my therapy. I used to, I used to joke with my wife, because sometimes I do have to joke about that. I used to joke with my wife that I was so skinny that I thought I could go hang gliding on a Dorito. You know, okay, I didn't say it was a good joke. But, I just said oh, it was no. a joke. <laughs> I, I think it's, it is funny, but it's one of those things where it's good that you can find the humor and such a tough time. So it's it like for me, I'm like, wait, that is funny, but should I laugh? Should I not should I laugh? laugh? At, right. Yeah. I like... love I love the fact that you are able to find the light in a dark spot. And and I think you have to. And so basically, if you can imagine being being on this drug, it was it was almost five years of having the flu every week. So chills, nausea, vomiting, headache, body aches, all that kind of stuff for two to three days every week for almost five years. And I do remember looking at my oncologist when she suggested that and saying, yeah, that, that just doesn't seem plausible. That just doesn't seem normal. I, I mean, how do people do that? She's like, it's going to be, she used a, a word other than tough, but it, you know, it's going to be very difficult on you. So anyway, so the disease, uh, once the drug was stopped, the disease came back in 2017. Um, and in 2018, I had my left foot amputated. Uh, disease came back in 2019 on my shin, requiring two more surgeries. And then last year, um, an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. Um, and then they tested me and my entire lower leg was full of cancer. So right in the middle of a global pandemic, April of last year, my wife drops me off at the hospital to have my leg amputated. Can't have any visitors, only surgery of the day. I talk about scary and, and, and just a horrible time. And I also found out I had tumors in my lungs and I am undergoing treatment right now to try to reduce those tumors. And, and I'm having some success. The tumors have, have decreased by about 20%, but my doctor isn't necessarily talking about a cure. He's more toward talking about buying me some more time. So that's kind of my cancer journey in a nutshell. Sorry to hear that. And I'm really hopeful that things will turn around and, and like you said, that they can figure out that God would touch the, the minds and of the doctors in their hands and anoint them to be able to figure out what they can do to help you and even figuring out how they can continue to advance science um, to, to help, especially with the cancer being so rare. Exactly. 
Exactly. And, and that's, you know, you think of melanoma as a, a spot on your skin, you know, a dark right. spot or something like that. And, and I've, and I've asked my doctor, you know, how did I get this? I, I mean, because I've had, there, there are 88 different genes that either cause cancer or that doctors think cause cancer. And I've had all of them tested and I have no mutations in, it, in any of my genes. So, oh, wow. you know, why did this happen? And my doctor's like, well, I don't know. Maybe it was a trauma that you had. And I'm like, you know, I, I've never hurt that foot. I've never broken that foot. I've never even had a sprained ankle on that foot. But the bottom line is that I don't spend a lot of time worrying about why no. I have it. You know, and it doesn't do me any good to kind of ponder why did this happen? It did happen. So now I have to deal with it. So you mentioned having two choices as a result of going through the pain and suffering um, prior to the interview um, you had shared. Can you share with our listeners what those two choices were? Sure. So I guess basically what I've learned is that, that you have these two choices. You can either succumb to the debilitating discomfort and misery, or you can learn to embrace it and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual. I chose the latter, but I want your audience to understand that there were days I felt so poorly and, and I was in so much agony that I literally prayed to die. I, I just wanted out of this life. Each day was a struggle to try, well, struggle to use my mind to override the apathy and the distress that my body was feeling. I realize that pain and discomfort can beat you to your knees and it can keep you there if you let it. But I also came to appreciate that I could use my pain and suffering to make me a stronger and more determined individual. Amen. So is, is that what kind of led you to moving forward with Motivational Check in 2019? Can you tell people about your journey to starting that site and also what they can expect from that site? Sure. So I had my leg amputated in, as I said, in, in January of 2018. And, and I had plenty of time to heal. And I used to lay in bed at night and kind of look at the ceiling and be like, okay, God, what next? What, what, what do you want me to do? Where, where are we going on this journey? Because you just took my foot now, you know, and I'm going to have to learn to walk again and stuff like that. And, and in all honesty, I was kind of hoping, you know, that the heavens would open and that, you know, the voice would come down and say, you will do this. There, there's an, another joke that, and you can laugh at this one if you think it's funny. <laughs> there's another joke that, that goes, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. And, and <laughs> in, in a way, that's true. I mean, nobody, God never spoke to me and said, Terry, right. do this. But what God did was put other people in my life and say, hey, Terry, you know, do you ever thought about doing a blog or do you ever thought about writing a book? And, and so, you know, and I, I mean, writing a blog, you got to understand, I'm barely able to turn my cell phone on in the morning. So, I mean, when, when it came time to writing, a, putting a <laughs> blog together, I, my original blog was four pages. It took me four months because I would, you know, I'd start something I'm like, I don't know what that means. So I'll go over here and research it, you know, and oh, okay, now I get, oh, wait a minute. I don't know what that means. Now I got to go research it. I'm sure my 25 year old daughter could have put it together in about 10 minutes, but it took literally, it took me four months to put this together. And then I was like, well, what, what do I call it? What, what do I, and I, I chose the title motivational check because when I was in the police academy, when whenever we were doing physical training or defensive tactics and somebody was, you know, they're having a tough day and, and you know, I'm hurting or I got a cramp or, or, you know, whatever it is, they could yell out motivational check. And the rest of us would respond with 84, which was our academy class number, just to let the person know that, you know, hey, we're hurting too but we're here with you, you know, and we're all in this together. You're not, you're not alone. We're, we're here with you. So I thought, wow, that would be a great title for this, this blog. And all the blog is, is a daily um, 
saying, quote, whatever you want to call that in some way I think has inspiration or motivation for people. Every Monday, I put the Monday morning motivational message on. And sometimes that's a story to read. Sometimes that's a video, but it's, and, and all my videos are, are short. They're, you know, five, no more than 10 minutes because I realize people are busy. But if you want to go and get a quick shot of, of inspiration or motivation, you can go to Motivational Check. You can find out the quote for the day and then just get on with your life and maybe apply that quote to how you live your life that day. So that's pretty much how Motivational Check, the, the, my, my blog came about. I love that. And for everyone listening, definitely check it out, motivationalcheck.com. I will also put the links in the description of the show so that you know how to contact Terry, which we'll talk about a, a little bit later on. And so you also recently wrote a book entitled Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. What can readers expect from your book and where can they purchase it? Let me let me kind of give you a, a, a why of, of the book, because I, I literally wrote the book between the time I had my leg amputated in April of last year and the time I started chemotherapy in June. So, so during, mm -hmm. I wrote it in, in three months, and, and I'll give you a little background about it. It was really born out of two conversations that I had. One was with a former player who she and her boyfriend had moved to Colorado, and my wife and I had had dinner with them a couple times. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited that you're here in Colorado because I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet. And after a while, she said, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I don't know what your purpose is. That's what your life should be about, finding that purpose and then living it. So that was one conversation. The second conversation was with a young man, actually from the Citadel, where I graduated, who was a basketball player who said, you know, what do you think are the things that I need to know to not only be successful in business or in my job, but in life? And I thought about it for a while, and I didn't want to give them the, the classic, you know, work hard, get up early, help others kind of thing. Not that those aren't important. They, they are very important. But I wanted to go deeper. You know, I kind of wanted to give him some things that would, would resonate in his soul, for lack of a better word. So, so I spent some time jotting notes down and, and putting things together. And eventually, I had these 10 principles or, or 10 ideas. And I was comfortable with it, and so I sent it to him. But then I kind of stepped back and I looked at him and I said, well, I have a life story about that principle, or I know somebody who has a life story about that principle. So I literally sat down at the computer with the principles and started to build stories underneath them that either illustrated the, the principle itself or stories about how the, the principle could impact or has impacted uh, somebody that I knew or, or somebody that, that I had read about. And then I had a book. Or, or did I have a book? You know, you, you don't know. I, you know, I, I, I always say I wrote the book, but I honestly believe it was inspired by God. I, I kind of think I was like, just sit down here and be quiet and do what I tell you and, you know, type away and, and, and there you go. So I gave it to some young friends of mine and I said, would you please read this and tell me if I'm all wet or if this is something that really might be something we should publish? They thought it was great, thought I, I should publish it. And so, so I did. And, and when I published it, I was all excited. And it was like, you know, okay, I, I got to sell books. I got to sell books. I got to sell books. And I had a, a, a best-selling business author in the UK who, who I'd been in contact with and was talking about publishing. And, and he said, and Terry, slow down. He said, you're not in the business of publishing books. You're in the business of helping people. If you help people, your books will sell themselves. And I was so glad he did that. I mean, it was like slapping me in the face, but I needed to be slapped in the face. And so now I spend more of, a, more of my time worrying about helping people. And if people want to buy the book, that's great. I, I didn't write the book to make money or to be famous. I wrote the book to help people. So that's kind of how it came about. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on barnesandnoble.com. You can buy it on Apple iBooks, pretty much anywhere you can get a book online. You can you can buy it. It's in ebook e form. It's it's in paperback. It's also in hardcover. So if, if you feel the opportunity to to pick it up, feel free to do that. And and 
And when you read it, send me a note. Let me know what you think. You know, tell me you, you, you thought it was good or what you liked about it and, and things like that. I'm always interested in, in hearing about that. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you that I will definitely send you my review because I have it on my computer right now. <laughs> so I'm Thank looking you. forward to diving in myself. So you actually talked to, when you talked about God and the inspiration for your book, what other areas has faith played a, a significant role? I feel like I've heard it throughout, weaved throughout your story, but I'd love to hear from your perspective specifically where you, where you see that faith showing up. I, I think the, the, what I call the three things that really have kind of gotten me through the, this whole journey are, are what I call the three F's, which are faith, family, and friends. And, and faith certainly being number one. And I, I have, unfortunately, when I was a police officer and certainly when um, with a number of people that I've met over the years who have cancer and things like that, I, I, I've seen a lot of people die. And I, I've had plenty of time to think about my own death. And, and when I die, I can't imagine standing in the presence of our creator, whoever or whatever you believe that entity to be, and being unable to account for the gifts and the talents that I was born with and that I didn't use to make the world a better place. And, and, and I've always been religious, I guess, for lack, lack of a better word. But, you know, for me, it, it goes so much deeper. And I, I think about my faith. I think about a God who made me in, in his image and likeness who made me in love, who made me knowing all the dumb, stupid, crazy, <laughs> idiotic, sinful things that I would do on my, in my life, and yet still loved me enough to put me on this earth and give me an opportunity to make it better. And when I think about that, when I think about how really insignificant I am, it, it really, you know, death doesn't scare me. And the reason it doesn't scare me is because I believe I found my purpose in life and I lived it. It's the people that, as, as I said, I've seen so many people die. And the people who, like you and I would probably think of as, as dying in a peaceful manner, those are people that found their purpose in life and they lived it. The people who go kicking and screaming, you know, who want another day or another month or another year, those are people who never did anything with their lives. They never saw the necessity to lead their uncommon and extraordinary purpose in life. And, and I, just, I, I just feel in my heart that, you know, I should probably be dead now. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, then several months ago, I was mm -hmm. coughing up bloody phlegm and was having trouble breathing. But all of a sudden now, I'm not having trouble breathing. And, and I, I really kind of believe that, that there's the hand of God, the, the, the breath of God, the love of God, the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, is kind of like, you know, I'm not done with you yet. Yeah, I know mm. you're sick. I know you want to just kind of lay on the couch and watch television. But no, no, I got other stuff for you to do. And, and, and I think if you're open to that, then, it, I mean, you, you are a miracle. I am a miracle. My neighbor is a mm. miracle. And if we just let that miracle shine forth, gosh, it's, it's amazing what we could do if we stop yelling and screaming at each other <laughs> and just spend in a moment. Because one of the chapters in my book, I talk about listening and, and not listening to respond, but listening to understand, you know, what are you saying and how are you saying it and why are you saying it? And if I can understand that, and then you can understand my reply on where I'm coming from. Now, now we've got a dialogue going. We're not screaming at each other. So right. yeah, faith is 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 really have been always at the central part of my life. And and I I hope to God it stays there for whatever time I have left. Amen to that. Terry, I just want to say that you have no idea how on time this message is, even for me. So this has been uh, it's just been a huge blessing. I knew that I would be inspired when I when I read your bio and I saw your site and all the things that you were doing. So thank you for your transparency and the strength to keep going because you are inspiring us to live our extraordinary lives, our uncommon lives. 
and really just using our gifts and talents. So thank you for using yours because you have no idea how much this impacts each of us. So thank you is what I will say. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. And, and as I said to you before we went on the air, thank you to people like you who give people like me an opportunity to get the message out. And between the two of us, hopefully we can make a difference in the life of somebody who hears us today. Definitely. So what are three phrases or words that come to mind for, for you for 2020? You know how people say, oh, I have a resolution. Are there three words that you think about when you think about, say, for instance, the rest of 2021 or just in general? I, I guess it's I, I have I had three sentences that okay. I was going to offer you. And re recently, literally within the last couple of weeks, I've added a fourth. I, I thought I've thought about it for a long time and I think it's important. So so I'll give you those I'll give you those four sentences. And and those are what I kind of try to describe as my truths. And the first one is you need to control your mind or it will control you. I mean, our mind knows our fears, it knows our vulnerabilities, it, it knows our weaknesses, and it will use that against us if we don't control it. That's the first one. The second one is you need to embrace the pain and the suffering that we all experience in life and use that pain and suffering to make you a stronger and more determined individual. And the third one, and this is this is the new one, this is the one I've added, and, and I'm looking at these because I have these literally on a post-it note on my desk that I get to see every day. And, and the third one is, is what we leave behind is what we weave in the hearts of other people. And then the fourth one is, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I use those as my truths. And, and I've had, I had a nurse recently who came to me and said, Terry, this trial that you're on, it's beating you up. I mean, it, it, it is very hard on you. You know, nobody would think anything less of you if you quit. And I tried to explain those truths to her. And I said, you know, my doctor may pull me off the study or I may die on the study, but I will never quit the study because that's just not who I am based on the truths that I just told you. Amen. And you're right. It's not in all of the different testimonies, every single one that you shared, the doctors may tell you what they think, but everything, like you said, you're a miracle. Because everything that they told you you couldn't do, you've been able to still do. And like you said, you're here for a reason. And I thank God for you. And I thank God for you sharing your testimony. And, and it's clear that you're here for a reason. Um, and like you said, all the things that you've gone through. So I would love for you to share with our listeners how they can connect with you. Sure. The easiest way is through motivationalcheck.com. I mean, there, there's access to buy the book. There's my social media sites. You can leave me a note. If you want to email me directly, it's motivationalcheck at AOL.com. Fantastic. And are there books that you would like to add or um, any questions that I didn't ask that you wish I would have covered? I'll, I'll end with, with two quick stories, if I may. Sure. Um, the, the, the first one is I, I've always been a big fan of Westerns. You know, growing up, my mom and dad used to let me stay up and watch Wild Wild West and Gunsmoke and things like that. In 1993, the movie Tombstone came out and it starred Val Kilmer as John Doc Holliday and Kurt Russell as Wyatt Earp. Now, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were two living, breathing human beings that actually walked on the face of the earth. They're not made up characters for the movie. And these two men couldn't have been more divergent in their, in their lives. Wyatt was a lawman pretty much his whole life. Doc, they called him Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but he was pretty much a card shark and a gunslinger. But somehow these two men formed a very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, um, Doc is dying in a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, about three hours from where I live. And, and Doc Holliday did die in that sanitarium. He's buried in the Glenwood Springs uh, Cemetery. And Wyatt is destitute in his life. He has no money, he has no job, he has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to, to visit Doc and the two men play cards to pass the time. And in this scene, they're talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, I was in love with my cousin when I was young but she joined a convent over the affair, but she's all I ever wanted. And he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? 
And Wyatt kind of nonchalantly says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal, there's just life. And get on with living yours. Would I like to not have cancer? You bet. I'd give a lot not to have this disease. But these are the cards that I've been dealt, and I have to play them. So I always try to tell people, you know what? You, you want your life, life to be this? You want your life to be that? You know what? There is no this or that. There's just life. And get out there and live your life to the best of your ability by finding your purpose and living it. Because at the end of your life, I always try to tell people, look at, look at the end. What are people going to say about you at your funeral? You know, what, what, what's your legacy going to be? If you get out there and find your purpose and live it, your legacy will be great. So that's one story. This, the second thing is really kind of I'd like to ask your listeners to do me this favor. For the next 30 days, everybody you come in contact with, assume that they'll be dead tomorrow. So the person who cuts you off in traffic today or, or the person who takes credit for your work at, you know, at your office or at school, or, or if you've got kids that are driving you crazy, just assume that they'll be, a, they'll be dead tomorrow. Because if you do that, two things will happen. Number one, you'll have a whole lot less stress in your life. And number two, you'll have a much greater appreciation for the miracle that we all are. Amen. I'm so glad that you shared those as well. Thank um, you. So I usually like to end the show with a, either having our guests share a personal affirmation or prayer. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to do both. <laughs> sure. Um, absolutely. So do you have a personal affirmation that you would like to share? I feel like you've shared so many <laughs> throughout the yeah, what do this I... episode. So so uh, I guess the affirmation will, will be this, that I've spent, and, and a lot of my book was about success. And, and you kind of meant, you kind of alluded to this as you were talking. And, and I've thought about that a lot. And I think success is important. Don't get me wrong. But I think what's even more important to each of us is another word that begins with S called significance. Success is what we do. You know, you're a successful podcaster. I may be a successful author. That's what we do. We're successful. But significance, that's what we do for other people. Now, I think you can be both. You can be successful and significant, but I think the focus needs to be off of success and more on significance. And so I guess from, a, from an affirmation point of view, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to spend more of my life on significance and less of it on what would make me successful. So that would be my affirmation. Beautiful. So... On that note, I will close us out in prayer and then we'll wrap up the show. Again, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So Lord God, I just come to you now thanking you for this opportunity to meet with Terry virtually and also to hear his story and his testimony. It is so evident that you have your hand on him and his family. And Lord God, we just pray that you would cover him right now, that you would continue to give him the strength that he needs to go through this battle that he is facing. We pray that you would touch him, Lord God, that you would heal him and give him the peace, Lord God, that only you can provide, that you would provide comfort and that you will continue to send people to Terry and to his family to give them the strength and the support that they need during these times. We thank you for all of the things that they've done, all of the things they've accomplished and all of the things that they will accomplish. We thank you for his significance. We thank you for the things that he is doing to leave a legacy, both in his family, with his friends, and even with the strangers that he meets every day and through platforms like the podcast that he has, has had an opportunity to be on. I just thank you, Lord God, for this time of fellowship. I thank you for this message. I pray that it would resonate with our listeners and that anyone listening to this show, Lord God, that anything that they're going through, that you would just help them in this season, help them to face their battles with strength, knowing that your word says that you will lift us up, that we will not dash our foot against the stone. We thank you for making us living miracles each and every day that we wake up and that we are able to breathe. We thank you for this time. We thank you for Mr. Terry, Lord God, and pray that you would just continue to cover him and his family. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. On that note, everyone, be blessed. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the CC America podcast. 
We appreciate you tuning in week after week and joining us for stories of faith, inspiration, and transformation. So that you never miss an update, please subscribe at www.ccamericapodcast.com. You can also follow us on all of our social media platforms at CC America LLC. You can also just search for CC America on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. We hope that you are encouraged and inspired by this show. If so, please don't hesitate to share the episodes or let people know that you are listening so that they too can be inspired. We appreciate your support and until next time, be blessed.